Poems to a Listener, readings and conversation with contemporary poets. When you drive, at dusk, alone, after the corn is harvested, the wind scatters bits of dry husk along the road. A farmer has draped a groundhog's carcass across the corner of a wire fence, and the crows have pecked out its eyes. Your headlights show these things to a part of your mind that cannot hurry, that has never learned to decide. While the car goes on, you get out and stand with the chaff blowing and crickets in the grass at the road's edge. In the distance, there is a dog barking and somewhere a windmill turning in the wind. Welcome to Poems to a Listener. I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program, we'll be visiting with poet Jared Carter of Indiana and listening to poems drawn mostly from his book, Work for the Night is Coming, published by Macmillan. The poem we just heard leaves us at the road's edge, looking out across an empty cornfield somewhere in the Indiana farmlands. The place... Uh is very vivid to me. It's a road just west of a little town of Plum Tree, and I was driving along there some 25 years ago and looked out and saw all this uh, in one of those rare moments when it all comes together and had a realization that the landscape had claimed me and that I had to live up to it and flesh out that vision that I had been bestowed upon me by. Mm -hmm. The, the terrain. And all that flatness. Right. <laughs> all that flatness. It's a windy place, isn't it? It's just a place where the weather changes a lot, and you might get wind one day and tornadoes following, and then something else will come along. Early warning. When the weather turned, crows settled about the house, cawing day long among the new leaves. It would be a hard spring, folks said. The crows, they know. There are folks up near where I come from in Missinawa County who study such things. Folks who believe tornadoes are alive, that polluted streams rise from their beds like lepers, following after some great churning, twisting cloud. With their own eyes, they've seen a cyclone stop, lap up electricity from a substation, then make a right angle turn and peel the roof off some prefabricated egg factory. Thousands of hens who've never seen the light of the sun or touched earth with their beaks go up the funnel like souls to God. Tornadoes are alive, as the poem says. Vengeful, almost, would you say? They probably don't like the idea of all those chickens penned up, but uh, where's that electricity coming from? It might be coming from some big nuclear power station down on the river. They might not like that, or they might think that's very tasty and, and sample a little of it. <laughs> go by. Lap it up. You hear stories about them going into creek beds and drinking and emptying the creek bed, taking the water away. And they can move locomotives and they can pick people up in their cars and set them down a mile away, still driving along. I mean, uh, I've talked to people who've been lifted up like that and have survived it. Hmm. Lifted right up? Yes. And sat down again unharmed. Of course, you don't talk to the ones who get sat down harmed. <laughs> they don't survive. So you don't want to be out in the open. The, the, the best advice is to get low and stay low. Don't even look up. <laughs> get in the ditch, get inside the culvert, and, and remain Hide. Right. <laughs> right. Weather prophet. Found on the back stoop, frozen stiff, on the morning after the storm, under a fingernail moon, this old keeper of bees, string saver, knower of clouds, 
whom the neighbors consulted faithfully each autumn for news of approaching snows, who was said to divine with woolly worms on bark and tell rain a week in advance, who carried instead, like extra bones, a pound of shrapnel from a botchy mine that lit up like a parachute flare at the slightest barometric change, and who, having outlived the bees and the last friend who could recall that war, took down a jar of pear wine and went outside in the snow to wait for something to pick him up, hopefully horse-drawn and slow. What do you suppose uh, persuaded him to, to do that? I think his life had, had played itself out and he had done all the things that he needed to do. I, I don't believe this was unfortunate or unhappy or, or accidental. He took the course that was available to him and he stayed around as long as the bees were still gathering honey and as long as he had somebody to talk with about when they were doughboys back yeah, in, in World War I. 17 yeah. when they finally right. got overseas and went to Paris. And he was wounded by a German mine there. Right. A botchy right. Bosch mine, yeah. And uh, uh, he's alone, so he goes out into the snow and waits, hopefully, as the poem says, for something horse-drawn and slow. He's old enough to remember a world of, of wagons and, and carriages and mules, and that was a time when he was happy, when he was young, and so it would be appropriate to leave in the same manner, slowly. And uh, he accepts that as right and proper. Walking the Ties. This was the old woman who ate canned dog food. This, the red wagon she pulled through the alleys. This, the pack of stray dogs that went with her. Here are the boys who shouted and threw things. Here are the barrels of trash they all searched through. Here are the boys' dogs barking at the old woman's dogs. There is the bar where she went each night to sit. There is a sparkling Schlitz sign over the mirror. There is the jukebox that only works if you kick it. These are the sleeves she touched each night when she left. These are the dogs coming out of the shadows to join her. These are the ties of the railroad tracks home. Yes, these are the ties of the railroad tracks home. She's a survivor. She was small enough that when she walked on the railroad tracks that she could easily step from one tie to the next and sort of scuttle down those tracks and she stayed off the main roads. You, you seldom saw her in broad daylight. And everyone said, well, she'll get taken out by one of those nickel plate trains one of these days. She never <laughs> did. She got hit by a car, finally. She had relatives in another town, and when she set off to see them, she went cross-country. She would go in a straight line, and didn't matter what was in the way. She'd go over fences, through woods, uh, past houses, across fields, <laughs> and she would arrive on the doorstep of the place she was going towards. And, uh, she was unstoppable. Right. Like. She just... When she got hit by the car, she landed on my doorstep. I on heard, your doorstep? I heard a noise one day and answered the door, and there she was, a heap of rags. She had been knocked 80 feet 80 in the air. feet? Yeah. And it was a great tragedy in the community because then I think we all realized what we'd lost, a perennial figure in all weathers marching down the alleys, searching out our coat hangers and our... In that small town where you grew up? Elwood, Indiana. Mm -hmm. 
When you yourself walk down the street today, for example, in that town, do you almost hear or touch the mood of a particular time? Yes. Things seem to linger around and, and be identified with this building or that facade or that sign. So one connects with that and then explores back into time using those, uh, those points of reference that may just seem like a dusty little, sleepy little Midwestern town to somebody else. But to me, they, they have meaning and resonance. Turning the brick. Men worked turning the brick at the end of our street. They gave each one a quarter turn and put it back again. That was what the Depression was like where I grew up. Each day they got closer to our house. Everybody came out to watch. They had their shirts off, down on their knees. Old scars flared in the sunlight. Tattoos glistened on their arms. Men with no teeth with noses turned and bent, fingers missing. The bricks were tan-colored. Each had a picture on the bottom, a scene of ships, a name, a date. One of the men brushed the sand from a brick and held it out. We gathered around. He let us touch the rough emblem, the letters, the year. He gave the brick a quarter turn put it back in the street, and went on. Why turn the bricks? It's the Depression, and 25% of the workforce is out of work, has nothing to do, and they're doing some things that are quite important. But they had all those people, and every once in a while, just to keep them busy, they set them to busy work. There are a lot of brick streets in those Midwestern towns, and the bricks would stay there forever if you left them alone. <laughs> so to take them up again and turn them, rotate them, and put them back... Mm. Is, Doesn't make, makes no sense. No, but it sure kept them busy. Uh, yeah. That particular brick was uh, issued in, in 1892 as a commemorative for the Columbian Exposition. And that's why it has the date on it. Right, it has a scene of the ships. Columbus's three right. ships, and it says... Uh, 1492, 1892, and the Columbian Exposition <laughs> brick. <laughs> One of the men shows you and the other children that insignia on the brick, the sign, the, uh, the picture, lets you feel the stone. Here's a workman who takes a moment and says, look at this, and you're a little bit broadened. There was a street there all this time which just looked very flat and simple to you. Well, it has words and dates and knowledge and lore underneath it. Right. You just have to lift up a piece here and there. To right. It. The poem seems to really show us the roughness, not only of the brick, but the time. It was a very grim time, and uh, the people around where I grew up really suffered from it. The gleaning. All day long, they have been threshing, and something breaks. The canvas belt that drives a separator flies off. Parts explode through the swirl of smoke and chaff, and he is dead where he stands. Drops the pitchfork as they turn to look at him, and falls. They carry him to the house and go on with the work. Five wagons and their teams stand waiting. It is still daylight. There will be time enough for grieving. When the undertaker comes from town, he brings the barber, who must wait till the women finish washing the body. Neighbors arrive from the next farm to take the children. The machines shut down one by one. Horses are led away. The air grows still and empty and begins to fill up with the sounds of cicada and morning dove. The men stand along the porch talking in low voices, smoking their cigarettes. The undertaker sits in the kitchen with the family. In the parlor, the barber throws back the curtains and talks to this man whom he has known all his life since they were boys together. 
As he works up a lather and brushes it onto his cheeks, he tells him the latest joke. He strops the razor, tests it against his thumb, and scolds him for not being more careful. Then, with darkness coming over the room, he lights a lamp and begins to scrape at the curve of the throat, tilting the head this way and that, stretching the skin, flinging the soap into a basin, gradually leaving the face glistening and smooth. And as though his friend had fallen asleep, and it were time now for him to stand up and stretch his arms and look at his face in the mirror and feel the closeness of the shave and marvel at his dreaming. The barber trims the lamp and leans down and says, for a last time, his name. I can hear him, the barber, saying the name, John, perhaps, or William, or James. Time to get up now. Yeah. Time to go back to work. Right. Time for him to get up and stretch and check his chin and go out. Mm -hmm. I wrote it a week before my father died. And I put it away, and then he died. And I realized that this was, this came from the part of me that was looking ahead and preparing to accept what might happen. Mm. So. It could be him, in a way. Yes. Uh, I'm there, perhaps, uh, one of those men on the front porch, smoking a cigarette, waiting. Not for anything in particular, just waiting to show your respect. Remembering. What's to come now is the funeral, the relatives pulling up in the yard, the, the minister arriving, the food being brought, the men in their coats and all dressed up in their sunburned faces. and. This would probably take place uh, three days later, but only when it was convenient for the harvest, mm. because there's an old saying, the harvest waits for no man. Harvest waits for no man. Right. The Odd Fellows Waiting Room at Glen Cove Cemetery. There must always be a place like this, where the dimensions collapse inwardly, like a telescope you slip into your pocket. Always a building with gables and arched windows. Always the polished floorboards of quarter sawn oak. The ceremonial chairs, the lectern, the gavel, everything made of oak, and oak outside and alive, shading this gathering place, measuring light falling through glass veins, stained green and gold. Oak nodding with a slow breath of wind in the boughs. If you could peer downward through this earth with such clarity, there would be only dust. If you could peer through the other end of things, there would be only dust too. What light reveals here in this room is the grain of the bare oak floor and the shadows of leaves moving with the grain. Where is this place? It's a little cemetery in the town of Knightstown in Henry County. Most of those old cemeteries will have a, a waiting room, and it's mm -hmm. because the cemetery was at least far enough away from the town that the procession, when you got out there, you had to water the horses and get off, and the women came in from the sun, and you take refuge from the heat of the day, and then prepare to walk out to where the, the grave was. To the cemetery? Yes. Well, when you come to the waiting room, everything else is behind you now, the, the funeral and the three days of mourning and the gathering of the relatives, and it's all compressed to this, this final moment when you conduct the last ceremony of putting the, the beloved one in, in the ground. And uh, 
in a few moments you'll be turning back. you have turn back towards the world of work mm -hmm. and activity and life and everything. And so it's all come to this last instant. The shadows of the leaves moving in the grain, moving with the grain. Yes. Monument City. This poem is about the building of a reservoir out in Indiana farmland, and they had to move whole cities, whole towns, cemeteries, buildings, everything else. And it affected the lives of a lot of people who lived there. How I came to that leaf-shadowed house by the river, late summer afternoon rain falling long into evening, to visit a favorite aunt who would ask the undertaker, his blue pickup truck pulled off just under the willows, to take photographs of the house and the gardens and the parlor with us in it one last time before the waters began to rise and scavengers came to pick over the buildings too big to be moved. She had seen his truck parked all summer in the churchyard, on the far side of the covered bridge, with a tent pitched first over this headstone, then that, until he and his helpers had taken them all up again like bulbs and planted them on higher ground in a cemetery provided by the government. An old friend of his, this woman with gray braids piled on top of her head, who had lived on the corner across from the monument and taught school 35 years until consolidation. He still lived on the second floor of the funeral parlor down at the crossing that had been a feed store once in his father's day, had carried two wives out through those double doors and a son to the churchyard. He brought with him now a box camera on a wooden tripod and sat with us there in the parlor till nightfall, waiting for the rain to stop, for there to be some light. How I came to be there that time, I cannot remember, only walking out to the flowers at dusk with the two of them into air fresh from rain and thunder far away to the east and lightning that showed us a path through the tall grass. Where did she go? After the reservoir mm. was built. Probably moved into town and maybe moved in with her relatives or might have had enough money to get a little house of her own, but the old days were, were gone. But the photographs will somehow help her, I, I think. Did he manage to take them? I... Well, I don't think he did. I think it rained a lot that day. I, I think the walk at the end was their way of affirming their old friendship and the time they'd known each other in this place, and they sort of had to take the pictures with their, with their minds then just to remember it like it was. And as it still is now in the poem and in their memories. The poem acts as the camera, in a way. I think so. The Cinewall Reservoir at Winter Pool. A reservoir is not like a lake. It depends on how much water is coming in. When it goes down in the fall, you can see where the town used to be. Brick foundations, chunks of concrete, things still not worn away. Sunday afternoons in October, the people who lived there once come back, drive their cars down to where the road breaks off. They walk out toward the river. Nothing remains. The walls of the houses are gone, the school, the church. There are no flowers, no trees. Even the cemetery has been moved. And yet, 
they have come home again. Nothing can harm them now. They walk to and fro, stopping to speak, nodding, as though having risen from a deep sleep and come at last to a place no longer having anything in it except themselves and as though always Why is it that nothing can harm them now? Well, they have gone through a great deal of stress. They, at one time, were completely dislocated from this place and gave it up, knowing that it would be submerged and destroyed. And as though a miracle had occurred, it turns out that the water recedes to a point where they may come back, and the same terrain is still there, the same hills, and they can at least imagine for mm -hmm. an afternoon that they're back there and they're beyond any pain or any suffering. They have survived it all and they have come through. And they see a few foundations. The piles that the bridge stood on and the cornerstones of the church. And with that, that's enough. With their imaginations mm -hmm. and their, their memories, they can recreate it all. Right. They carry it within them now and they can summon it and share it with each other as they pass, nodding, saying hello, mm -hmm. greeting old friends, shaking hands remembering. So in a sense it's not lost, it's been preserved by the people who loved it. As though always. As though it never gone away. The Enchantment. In June, early in the month, after rains had made the ground soft and darkened the grass, and a clear wind all day long kept lifting the tree limbs and smoothing their undersides. That day, we talked. Stacks of new books ranged before us on the wicker table, iced tea glasses making rings of moisture, and looked out into light that shifted with each change of wind and glossy leaves that seemed still half asleep in their slow turning. And a bumblebee, driven by the breeze, sailed in from the rosebush near the steps and held us there, two native Hoosiers, knowing from earliest childhood what to do, become as statues waiting to be freed from some invisible enchanter's spell and neither speak nor move, so that a passerby who saw us sitting there might well have wondered at the sight of two grown men eyes closed, heads bowed, not knowing that the sudden stillness flowing through each moment is neither grace nor prayer, but simply there. We've been visiting with poet Jared Carter and listening to poems drawn mostly from his book Work for the Night is Coming, published by Macmillan. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for being with us. Poems to a Listener was produced by Henry Lyman in cooperation with WFCR Amherst, Massachusetts. Financial assistance was provided by the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities and Public Policy.